Welcome to the Ash Cloud. I'm Ash Sweeting. Today we are joined by Richard Heath, the founding CEO of the Zero Net Emissions from Agriculture Cooperative Research Centre that aims to catalyse the Australian agricultural industries, community and government to achieve zero net emissions from agriculture by 2040. 73 partners who committed $87 million in cash and then the government committed to match that dollar for dollar and then with in-kind contributions as well it took it to a $300 million program over 10 years which is the biggest CRC that's ever been funded. Many companies are committed to reduce their footprint but lack viable and implementable solutions to achieve these targets. So many of the supply chain companies and partners that are making commitments about achieving net zero at various points and, and how they're going to do that uh, and a lot of the time they're making commitments in you know, largely the absence of pathways for delivery uh, and technology solutions that can help them get there so there's a very high level of interest in investing in solutions to make sure that they can meet their commitments. Methane is a major focus. Most of the emissions um, come from cattle um, and, and cheap, you know, red meat, basically ruminants um, as methane. So uh, obviously that's where most of the investment will be. We need to be watching the grass grow. To be honest, I, I see some uh, really early wins with some of the new uh, pasture species that are very close to commercialisation that have methane reducing potential. There's a lot that we are yet to know. We'll be working uh, very much on the uh, genetics of animals, uh, estimated breeding values, improving those, uh, getting good EBVs for uh, methane efficiency. Um, we'll also be working on measurement and validation systems. And, and that is one of the big things that's missing in this whole environment is accurately quantifying what is actually going on. There are no simple solutions. We need to be thinking about stacking technologies into an overall farm system. There will not be a silver bullet. There will not be one widget. There will not be a single policy that will go towards how we solve emissions uh, from agriculture. It's going to be the story that developing agri best practice in agriculture has always been, which is incremental lots of things stacked together to build better systems. There are no substitutes for excellent management and no excuses for poor management. Productivity gain, just general productivity gain, right? You, you know, getting weaning weights one week earlier, two weeks earlier, a month earlier, is actually a methane efficiency story as well. Almost all better farming practice in animals and productivity gains have a positive emission story. Because if you are uh, you know, raising healthy animals that are converting feed really well and reach, reaching a, a, a weaning or a sale weight a month earlier than they would be otherwise, that's a month of avoided emissions. Government has a critical role. The Australian government is doing really actually quite well um, in this space at the moment. They are um, enabling industry to move on this and uh, rather than uh, imposing targets, imposing goals, imposing taxes, um, they really are about, we understand that industry actually has an interest, more than an interest, has a requirement to reduce emissions, we will help industry, the government, this is the government saying you know, we, that, that we will help industry achieve this through facilitating R&D, setting up, you know, making sure that the trade arrangements are appropriate, all those sorts of things. Solutions must be local. Sustainability requirements associated with trade need to be place-based. They cannot be global. They cannot be universal because sustainability solutions that might work in Europe or North America or South America or Australia or Asia will not work in other countries and other areas. Um, the values are the same that we're all trying to deliver against, and that's what we should focus on. Farmers are needed. In terms of farmers becoming involved, we are going to have a network of 25 producer demonstration sites all over the country, which we 
really hope will be the bit of the CRC that farmers can go and see, touch and feel um, to see technologies being demonstrated at scale, commercially stacked together. <laughs> Richard, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Ash. Happy to be here. The zero net emissions uh, for agriculture CRC is very, very new. Could you please tell me about what you're hoping to achieve and what it's for, who your partners are? Sure. So um, we're trying to achieve exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, we are the zero net emissions from agriculture CRC, and we are trying to provide not trying to, we will. I'm going to be confident about this. We will provide um, farmers with the tools, technologies and systems to be able to achieve zero net emissions from their businesses um, and from agricultural supply chains. The CRC program is a uh, program funded by the Commonwealth Government of Australia. It's been around for a few decades now. The way it operates is that the government has uh, a bid round generally every year. Sometimes it might be a bit less frequent than that, where uh, they provide the opportunity for a uh, research lead, gen generally not always a university or a State Department of Agriculture or, or you know, state government, they're not all agriculture, the CRC is sort of right across the economy, um, to pull a whole lot of partners together um, because it is, again, as what it says on the tin, a cooperative research centre. It is dependent on lots of people coming together um, into an alliance, into a cooperative group. Um, and then those people need to be able to commit cash and in kind to uh, research a particular focus idea. Now, uh, if the bid's successful, then the government will match those co cash contributions, generally dollar for dollar. For this CRC, uh, and I'll, I'll get to why in, in such a, in, in a minute, but um, for this CRC, there were 87 partners uh, in the end uh, who uh, committed cash and in-kind to the bid process. Um, sorry, 73 partners. I'm still getting my head around the numbers. This is very fresh. 73 partners who committed $87 million in cash. Now, that's a hugely significant amount because that's, you know, that's not, that's the cash that they're putting into the bid. Uh, and then the government committed to match that dollar for dollar. And then with in-kind contributions as well, it took it to a $300 million program over 10 years, which is the biggest CRC that's ever been funded out of the program. Um, and I think really it's not surprising that it's had such a high level of interest and has ended up being the biggest CRC. When you look at the urgency for solutions to be delivered um, around achieving net zero in, in agricultural supply chains, everyone is demanding that to happen through various mechanisms. Uh, you've got so many of the supply chain companies and partners that are making commitments about achieving net zero at various points and, and how they're going to do that. Uh, and a lot of the time they're making commitments in you know, largely the absence of pathways for delivery uh, and technology solutions that can help them get there. So there's a very high level of interest in investing in solutions to make sure that they can meet their commitments. So our partners, as well as the research providers, universities and state governments of agriculture, we've got 11 universities involved with like every state and territory in Australia that are partners as well. Um, they're also global agribusiness and supply chain companies and retailers um, that are the organisations that are making these commitments, but then you know needing to back it up with investment into delivering solutions that will help them meet their commitments as well. So a really big initiative, a very big partnership, lots of excitement as it gets underway, um, great spirit of collaboration and a sense of urgency to actually start getting stuff delivered. Wonderful. So you voluntarily signed up Pity, to be the person with uh, 70 or 80 people knocking on your door saying, mm -hmm. we need to get over to the other side of the river. We have no idea how we're going to get there. And you're sitting there saying, I'm going to solve your problems. So yeah, it's crazy. Your, it? your perception, <laughs> why did you jump into that? That's, you know, that's. Okay. So look, it's also I think, not straightforward. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly exciting opportunity um, and I really can't wait to get my teeth into it. So uh, 
a bit of background I'd get about myself possibly might help in understanding that. I've been a farmer most of my life. Um, I farmed for 20 years on the Liverpool Plains of New South Wales. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be in a family farming business that appreciated research and development that participated in trials that you know did a lot of our own trials um, I did a Nuffield scholarship myself um, looking at nitrogen use efficiency it, it's something I've just always had a very strong interest in is research and development innovation and technology to meet the sustainability challenges and the climate crisis that we're, we're facing um, and so you know since since I finished farming I've been involved in some policy roles as well that have sort of been looking at the appropriate policy to uh, enable the development of, of all these technologies and meet these challenges. Uh, now to have this opportunity to get more back into the applied side of things uh, and invest in the development of these solutions, it's, it's something that I'm just tremendously excited about. Wonderful. So in terms of net zero and or zero net emissions, and yeah. what the priorities are. Do you want us to talk th talk us through through those those areas? So, most of the emissions um, come from cattle um, and, and sheep. You know, red meat basically ruminants um, as methane. So, uh, obviously, that's where most of the investment will be. But this is a zero net emissions from agriculture program we will be looking at all of agriculture we will have a large and distributed portfolio that will be working across all sectors and all geographies in australia um where are the priorities um the priorities will be across the board um so it might help just to outline really quickly what our main research pillars are and programs and how the crc is going to be structured um, so th there's four programs. Uh, they are basically plants as pillar one, animals as pillar two, pillar three is whole farm systems, and pillar four is the other opportunities that are coming out of the transition to net zero in the entire economy that can be pulled into farm businesses to uh, help as well um, and provide opportunity. So going through them in a bit more detail, uh, the first one being plants, um, that will be cropping systems, horticulture, looking at things like coated fertilisers, fertiliser efficiencies, um, bringing more legumes into systems, uh, looking at potentially agroforestry and how that can be incorporated into cropping systems. So very broadly how the uh, uh, cropping systems and, and plants um, can be, be focused on um, to reduce emissions, but also in that plants pillar there'll be a very significant part of that that is still working towards um, the methane issue and animals through improved pastures uh, and plants as pastures, basically. And that's one of the things as I've sort of got into this where, to be honest, I, I see some uh, really early wins with some of the new uh, pasture species that are very close to commercialisation that have methane reducing potential. In terms of the adoption issues around um, you know, how we, we modify grazing systems to reduce emissions, changing the pastures, the plants that animals eat, that's one of the easier things to do. Um, so, you know, if, if, it, if people are already planting pastures in intensive grazing systems, obviously this might imply so much for rangeland, rangeland uh, work, but if you're already planting pastures in intensive systems, it's just putting a different bag of pasture seed um, in the mix and, you know, you get that established and you just start reducing methane emissions. So that, that's, you know, quite exciting for me with my farmer hat on in terms of the, the cost of transition and adoption and um, technology and, and the ease of doing that. Pillar two is working on the animals themselves much more directly. So that is, you know, what a lot of people would typically associate with the effort for emissions reduction, it's room and manipulation, it's active compounds and, and how they can help. Um, we won't work directly on the active compounds themselves, things like asparagopsis, because basically because there's just a lot of work being done in that space already, um, a lot of research, a lot of programs that are looking at exploring the actives. What we feel we can do, um, and, and one of the questions that gets asked a lot, it, particularly in the extensive grazing systems, is about delivery 
of those compounds. Um, so how do we, you know, we, we might find something that has a, a fantastic uh, effect on, on reducing methane emissions. But if it's something that requires a feed additive or much more intensive sort of work with animals to actually get it into the animal, it just doesn't work in extensive systems and rangelands. So what else can we do in terms of uh, getting those active compounds delivered into animals effectively in extensive systems? So we'll have quite a program around that. Um, we'll be working uh, very much on the uh, genetics of animals, uh, estimated breeding values, improving those, uh, getting good EBVs for uh, methane efficiency. Um, we'll also be working on measurement and validation systems. And, and that is one of the big things that's missing in this whole environment is accurately quantifying what is actually going on. We still rely a lot on modelling um, and uh, the ability to more directly measure methane outputs uh, is going to have a huge impact on not just, you know, we need that to actually have credible systems around rewards for farmers that achieve methane reductions, but it's also really important to know that we're getting the results we think we are from technological change as well. Um, things like developing uh, EBVs, uh, any other estimated breeding value, you can generally understand whether you're getting the, the what you think you hope to be getting out of that those improved genetics by measurements on farm over Y scales or you know something else condition scores whatever um, we need to be able to do that with methane in the same way so that you know when you're introducing new genetics that you are actually getting uh, a positive effect on on methane emissions as well um pillar three so whole farm systems really important and a fundamental principle in the way this crc is going to operate is that we need to be thinking about stacking technologies into an overall farm system. There will not be a silver bullet. There will not be one widget. There will not be a single policy that will go towards how we solve emissions uh, from agriculture. It's going to be the story that developing agri best practice in agriculture has always been, which is incremental lots of things stacked together to build better systems. So uh, again, with the measurement and validation side of that, that's quite hard to do once you're not measuring one thing, if you're measuring lots of things, uh, and particularly in the context, if the uh, recognition and reward systems around that in terms of potential for carbon credits or insetting or you know something other than the productivity and profitability gain that you're getting from adopting those technologies, um, they need to have good measurement and validation systems. And again, we don't really do that well for whole farm systems um, at the moment. So that'll be a really important and big uh, component of the, the CRC as well. And then finally, uh, there is so much going on in the entire, the whole of economy transition to net zero around renewable energy, um, you know, hydrogen, solar, uh, circular economy concepts, what are we doing with waste? Um, and so what are those opportunities that can be readily pulled into and taken advantage of by farm businesses uh, to, to, you know, for reward, um, but also just to improve their net zero position as well and to enhance their productivity and profitability. Um, so a really broad scope of stuff, uh, quite ambitious, but, you know, we've, we've got the resources to do it and, and hopefully we will make a real real difference there. That is a very exciting uh, group of, of focus areas. I am particularly excited by the the interaction, the whole farm system side of things, because when animals are grazing, they're also fertilizing. Yep. They're also changing the way water moves through soil um, and that impacts plant nutrient composition and and yeah. and so so many things and the flow of gases both mm -hmm. back and forwards and the need for external impacts and um it's, it's one of those fascinating things because what might be the right thing to do last week will not necessarily be the optimal thing to do next week because you know you're in an, an open air system where where everything's constantly changing so with with all of that and i guess from the you know, there will need to be monitoring, you said, data systems. How does that fit into the whole the whole process? Do they sit within the pillars or do they sit um, kind of across across the whole program? Or is that yet to be determined? That's work in progress. 
Yeah, look, work in, work in progress. I mean, um, you know, data and, and data infrastructure and, and systems and protocols around, you know, how data is transferred to enable in the better accounting across multiple farm systems. Yeah, that's a that's a, a big challenge that we've been addressing in agriculture for a while now, you know, going right back to the early days of ag tech and, and data integration and technology integration. It continues to be a challenge. Um, it's getting better, I think, um, you know, it continues to get better and um, standards around um, protocols for data transfer and things like that are, are helping with all of that. Um, but it is still, there's no question, it is still a barrier for effective accounting um, in in developing those really good fluid data systems. And of the the people that um, are partners and they're all Australian based or is it open to international people to participate or international organizations and companies to to join in as well? Uh, we have some global agribusinesses involved. Um, we have some uh, New Zealand businesses involved. Uh, there are limitations in terms of funding research uh, occurring in another country. But absolutely, we're open to working with international organisations that are researching here, that are operating in Australia, um, and, you know, as we should be. And we'll also be very much looking outwardly to the rest of the world in terms of what's happening in the research space, you know, how we can leverage that, how we can work collaboratively with other organisations internationally that are working in the same space as well. That, um, great to hear about the collaboration. And... In terms of you know the projects, the research, the ideas, how to how or the technologies that are coming through, how how does one one how does that work? And secondly, what's some of the exciting stuff that has been coming across your desk um, up to date? Sure. So look, we'll, we'll have um, as any you know reasonably large research investment program has. Uh, a, a portfolio that spreads risk, that spreads technology stages, you know, where it's at in the innovation cycle in terms of whether it's more at the R end, whether it's more at the commercialization end, uh, we'll have a, a full portfolio of work. But one of the, well, not one, the, the consistent thing that will be present across every project that we invest in, this is an industry-led CRC. We have lots of industry partners, supply chain partners that are involved. Every, uh, as a, a compulsory requirement for every research project for it to be invested in, um, they, it will have to have an industry partner involved in the project whose role will be to uh, advise, participate in, provide a pathway for impact uh, and commercialisation. Uh, and it's really important that we do that to, to get impact. Um, we'll also have uh, an industry advisory committee that's made up of, of um, uh, representatives of our industry members that advise the board again on barriers to adoption, um, impact pathways, commercialisation considerations, so that we ensure that everything we're doing has the next user identified um, and more than the next user being identified, the next user participating um, and, and understanding what is coming through so that uh, outputs from a research project are ready to be adopted by whoever that next user is. And the next user, if it's close to market, the next user may be the farmer. Um, if it's at the other end of the innovation cycle, the next user, you know, if we're talking about a genetics project or something like that, the next user might be a seed development company or, uh, you know, but we're just going to really make sure and put a lot of effort into making sure that that, um, uh, that, that pathway to impact is understood. Um, everyone knows where they sit in the innovation cycle and what the next step of that's going to be. You were recently up at Beef Week in Rockhampton and during that time, you know, you've, you've spoken about all the support you've had from governments, from the universities, from um, large global agribusiness and Australian agribusiness. I'm, I'm guessing at Beef Week, you spoke to many farmers, many producers. What's what's their take? What's the, the vibe in that space? So, look, it's not uncommon, I think, to a discussion that's happening globally at the moment uh, around uh, methane um, and how methane should be counted, 
and then what the consequences of those accounting methodologies are in terms of expectations of uh, improvements against goals and targets that are being set. That, that's a universal discussion that's being had um, at the moment. Now, it's a discussion that absolutely has to have, has to happen. Um, it's important in terms of commitments that are being made globally um, and understanding about how achievable those commitments are um, or should be. I, from a pure research and development point of view and leading the pol leaving the policy question of that to decide a little bit, I see a win-win situation regardless of the policy environment that a focus on reducing methane from cattle and making it cheap and making it more methane efficient delivers. And, and that is really two things. Uh, we all accept now that we are in a climate crisis, that we need to do something about the climate. Otherwise, the, the future of agriculture um, is at risk, enhanced risk, uh, and it's going to make it much more difficult. There is also no question that removing methane from the atmosphere will have a cooling effect. So it's important that we re reduce methane, uh, that we remove methane from the atmosphere to help with mitigating that, that climate crisis. So then you look at, well, who should be doing that? Where are the responsibilities? How can we do that? You know, how can anyone that, that uh, is in the economy anywhere that, that has methane emissions, uh, what can I do about it? What responsibility do I have to do about it? Uh, and that's where I sort of leave perhaps, you know, to avoid getting into some of those discussions that immediately get can get quite defensive when you start talking about a responsibility to do something to what's the advantage of doing something. And I think in agriculture, with some of the technologies that are, uh, are getting very close to market now, and, and, and you know, they're, they're going to have a genuine productivity and profitability impact in making animals more methane efficient while reducing methane emissions. So it is a win-win situation. Uh, you know, the, if, if there is carbon in the feed the animals you know to, to really sort of bring it down to the most basic equation if there's carbon in the feed that animals are eating whether it's pasture or rations or whatever uh and that carbon is going into the atmosphere as methane rather than going into the animal um as production um then that's waste you know that, that that's a productivity lost so if we can change that equation and we can make sure that more of that carbon is getting converted into productivity uh, at a cost that is profitable, um, then why wouldn't we be wanting to do that? Why wouldn't we be wanting to explore that and at the same time get the methane reduction, which you know looks at which addresses that long-term issue around the climate crisis? Lots, lots to go on from there. Um... In terms of, you know, we only understand the number varies somewhere 10, 15, 20% or no of what's going on in the rumen in terms of that rumen microbiome population. So there's a lot of foundational research that's needed to be done there. Um, there's a whole lot of work led by Rod Mackey at the University of Illinois looking at the biokinetics of hydrogen, largely funded or partially funded by the um, Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research. There's other projects. You know, that's a that's a combination of Australian research, New Zealand research, European research, and here in the US and Canada. Um, there are other people looking at that as well. UC Davis is working with UC Berkeley on using CRISPR to gene editing to try and enhance the microbiome for exactly the same purpose, but it's all very foundational. So where's your, I guess, where does that fit into starting from scratch and doing the research in Australia when we can collaborate more broadly and also that balance between, you know, investing in that foundational research, which will have a longer time to gain a return, but have a bigger impact compared with some of the things that might be more immediate? So I think sometimes what gets lost in this discussion 
all that foundational stuff is incredibly important, right? And that leads to transformational change down the track when we start being able to manipulate rumens significantly, change the way they behave, introduce new genetics. But productivity gain, just general productivity gain, right? You, you know, getting weaning weights one week earlier, two weeks earlier, a month earlier is actually a methane efficiency story as well. Almost all better farming practice in animals and productivity gains have a positive emission story because if you are uh, you know, raising healthy animals that are converting feed really well and reach, reaching a, a, a weaning or a sale weight a month earlier than they would be otherwise, that's a month of avoided emissions. Um, so, you know, I, I think that in terms of close to market stuff and uh, getting stuff out there that that is genuinely having an impact on the emission story in animals, um, I think we actually need to recognise that th it's been happening for a long time. It can continue to happen more just through actually a focus on standard best practice management of animals and understanding what that best practice management and improvements in best practice management have on the emissions equation as well. So I think there's a lot of stuff that's actually happening every day and, and is close to market. And then you throw in the, tran the, the transformational uh, foundational science stuff as well. Um, and that's why I'm gen genu genuinely excited about where I think we can go. I, I think we can have really significant improvements um, over time. And that gives you a pathway to make in, you know, short-term gains by those management yes. practices, starting to monitor methane and and managing around that as well as, and that gives time for the longer term uh, interventions, such as the time it will take to include into breeding programs, as well as some of the, the, the room and microbiome work to, to get to the stage of commercialization. Exactly. Yes. There's been, I guess if you look at, across the the world, there's a lot of people talking about uh, net zero and emissions and emissions from livestock. And there's different approaches in different jurisdictions. New Zealand was looking at, um, you know, putting caps on emissions and they backtracked. Netherlands and Denmark have put in quite restrain, uh, quite you know, they're they're planning quite big restrictions, and that's led to political unrest. California's mandated a 40% reduction by 2030. Um, if you head a bit further east of here and across the other side of the Rockies, there's a lot less stringent um, regulations. Um, where Australia's had a chance to, to, and I know you're not in policy now, but Australia has had a chance to sit and look at what other parts of the world are doing, um, many of them our trading partners. And how do you see the balance between those options in terms of, you know, navigating for the best outcome and, you know, maintaining geopolitical stability and, or political stability within the country and, and ensuring that no one feels like they're being ostracised or isolated by, by the government and the communities? So there's three things that I think the Australian government is doing really actually quite well um, in this space at the moment. The first is that they are um, enabling industry to move on this and uh, rather than uh, imposing targets, imposing goals, imposing taxes, um, they really are about, we understand that industry actually has an interest, more than an interest, has a requirement to reduce emissions. We will help industry, the government, this is the government saying you know, we, that, that we will help industry achieve this through facilitating R&D, setting up, you know, making sure that the trade arrangements are appropriate, all those sorts of things. So as long as they continue to do that, I think that's creating a really good environment. Uh, the other thing that they're in that sort of saying, we recognise industry has a requirement to do this it is very much around recognising that trade environment for emissions reduction. Australia is a, a totally uh, export dependent agricultural economy and increasingly the requirements to demonstrate sustainability credentials with exports um, are becoming a condition of trade. 
what the, the the second thing that that the government I think is doing quite well in Australia, and I would like to see a much better approach to this globally, is recognizing that for that to deliver true sustainability outcomes, that sustainability requirements associated with trade need to be place-based. They cannot be global. They cannot be universal because sustainability solutions that might work in Europe or North America or South America or Australia or Asia will not work in other countries and other areas. Um, the values are the same that we're all trying to deliver against, and that's what we should focus on. We should all be trying to deliver, improve, you know, have trade conditions that enhance the prospects of improving biodiversity, reducing emissions, um, you know, all those sorts of sustainability attributes. But to think that uh, by doing that, we impose strict conditions around methodologies, around practices, around, you know, a set of laws that would apply everywhere is going to deliver perverse sustainability outcomes. So, you know, again, I think that the Australian government's been quite good in uh, in international forums in bringing that up as uh, an issue that needs to be resolved and, and have trade based on, on values rather than prescribed practices. In terms of if you want to get involved with the CRC, be that as a producer, as a agribusiness, as a, a technology company or a startup, what's the what's the process? So the the CRC is a member based company. Um, we will have a process where uh, organisations can join as members. Um, right now, we're just concentrating. We're literally a startup, getting everything established, getting agreements signed with existing members, a Commonwealth agreement uh, that is going to consume us for some time, um, being such a large organisation. But once the CRC is up and running and operating, then um, we will have a process where organisations can express an interest uh, in becoming a member and can go through a process to do that. Um, in terms of farmers becoming involved, we are going to have a network of 25 producer demonstration sites all over the country, which we really hope will be the bit of the CRC that farmers can go and see, touch and feel. Um, to see technologies being demonstrated at scale commercially stacked together uh, and uh, act as a real extension mechanism, adoption mechanism. Um, that's not all we'll be doing. We'll be doing having lots of extension channels and opportunities um, for farmers to see what's happening with the possibilities uh, around emissions reduction technology. I know it's very early days, so... Um... There's not a lot come in yet, but is there any, are there any projects, any, anything that's come through that you're very excited about that you can share with us at the moment? Sure. So look, some of the, I mentioned before, just the, um, the breeding efforts into pastures uh, that are looking at things like the way that, or, you know, and, and, and understanding that the way that compounds are, expressed in the flowers of a pasture plant compared to the leaves differ. And in fact, the way that those compounds are expressed in the flowers are lower methane reducing, um, you know, or they have a bigger methane reducing potential. So if there's a way of engineering that into the leaves as well as the flowers, then you start reducing methane. You know, th th there's so many really interesting and intriguing plant breeding efforts that we can look at just by starting to screen a bit more and understand the way that uh, plants get uh, metabolized in the room of animals um, and understanding that every plant is different, every part of a plant is different um, in that context. Uh, and so once we have that understanding, how can we focus on either the parts of the plants or the different plants that have uh, a methane reducing impact. So, you know, for instance, thinking about endemic pastures rather than improved or planted pastures and the number of species that are in an endemic pasture mix, say across Northern Australian rangeland, screening all of those to see which ones have, uh, you know, a, a bigger methane reducing potential. And then once we understand that, is there 
grazing systems, agronomy, is there indigenous knowledge that we can harness and understand to boost the you know those plants in the endemic mix compared to others, uh, and then have a you know a significant methane reducing potential as a result of that. So I think that there's you know, a, a whole range of stuff that we can do in the plant space uh, that uh, with with a focus on on methane reduction from animals just through that. Firstly, screening to understand um, you know, how, as I said, how the, either parts of plants or the plants themselves um, have different effects. And then once we have that knowledge, what can we do about it? I love the love the pasture side of things because you know it, it's a it's a, a tool and a technique or a management practice that people have been using for for decades or yeah. centuries and so there's no no behavioral change no new management systems and all that sort of stuff and and what you just said is actually really interesting because it possibly means we have to reevaluate some of the priorities in terms of plant breeding where for the last number of decades it's been vegetative growth vegetative growth mm. delay delay the onset of flowering but then maybe you want to have more diversity in terms of that onset of flowering or maybe you need to mm. adjust your grazing practices so management tweaks with the different species to to get that combination between the different parts of the plant so absolutely yeah. fascinating yeah richard it's been wonderful talking to you and before we go is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't already discussed uh look not really i mean early days as you've said it's early exciting days though um i've been so encouraged getting into this job just with the spirit of collaboration that's been there amongst all the partners that really want to roll their sleeves up and have a go and get things done um and so you know with that sort of attitude amongst all our partners and uh, I, I i'm just so excited about getting this thing underway and starting to fund projects and seeing the impacts of that on the ground um and, and having a significant impact wonderful well thank you very very much for joining us today thanks ash you've been listening to the ash cloud with me ash sweeting in conversation with richard heath recorded in california in may 2024